This section here is dealing with what we would call perseverance of the saints or eternal security. Okay. Now, as you see how it flows from all these different things that we've seen, you know, so far in the confession, this is kind of a natural uh, way that follows after our good works. Okay. So we are doing our good works out of love and gratitude to Christ. We, it, he's married our salvation and justification. He's sanctifying us by his spirit. And he's bringing that all about for his purpose, which will lead to glorification, which will lead to eternal life, which means perseverance of the saints. Okay, now, if you're looking in the confession of faith, if you have this, you can look at paragraph one is pretty lengthy. It's very lengthy, actually. Now, if you have your uh, Trinity hymnal and you're looking at the Westminster, you can see that uh, the Westminster one is a lot shorter. Now, I will say this, it's not because they disagree in any doctrine at all. They all agree substantially. In fact, you'll see the first half is all pretty much word for word. But in the first London, this was before Westminster ever came out, uh, first London confession, they had an extensive paragraph on perseverance of the saints, right? And they really, they really liked how they articulated that. And so they just continued it in. They just added it in with also what Westminster and Savoy already say. So they're all in complete agreement. They just wanted to continually strengthen and, and reemphasize or, or just continually saturating their understanding of how they saw scripture uh, in their sentence as well. And so you're gonna see uh, a lot of these sections, the wording, it sounds familiar. And it's because they're reflecting on different scriptures that speak of these things. So let's just read it at first and it might sound a little odd, so if you do have a modern English translation, maybe uh, look and glance at some of the uh, differences that I read here. But I'll be reading from the original here. It says, Those whom God has accepted in the Beloved, effectually called and sanctified by His Spirit, and given the precious faith of His elect unto, can neither totally nor finally fall from the state of grace, but shall certainly persevere therein, to the end, and be eternally saved, seeing the gifts and callings of God are without repentance, whence uh, he still begets and nourishes in them faith, repentance, love, joy, hope, and all the graces of the Spirit into immortality. And though, and though the many storms and floods arise and beat against them, yet they shall never be able to take them off the foundation and rock which by faith they have fastened upon. Notwithstanding through unbelief and temptations of Satan, the sensible sight of the light and love of God may for a time be through unbelief and the temptations of Satan. The sensible sight of the light of love, uh, light and love of God may for a time be clouded and obscured from them, yet he is still the same. And they shall be sure to be kept by the power of God unto salvation where they shall enjoy their purchased possession, they being engraved upon the palm of his hands and their names having been written in the book of life from all eternity. Okay. So here, following uh, the normal pattern that they do in the confession is the first paragraph is kind of giving you a definition and overview, right? And then the next two paragraphs will further emphasize uh, certain things. So here we see a very big paragraph here. And, uh, you know, my professor said, thankfully, run-on sentences do not make a confessional confession invalid or valid. So there's a lot of run-on sentences here. Um, but it's okay. It just is continually flowing out. So let's just look at this briefly here. Um, first off, anyone notice any, any language that seemed odd or different there? Um, maybe in uh, your modern one? Anything stand out yet? If not, we'll go back and we'll look at this a little bit more. I'll bring it out. All right, well, let's just look first and we'll, we'll see some of these differences as we, as we uh, continue. So the first thing is perseverance asserted, right? Perseverance asserted. So here's what it is. Notice first who it applies to, who perseverance applies to. It says, those whom God has accepted in the beloved effectually called and sanctified by his spirit and given them precious faith of his elect unto. So who are these people who 
are the, the subjects of perseverance here. Perseverance of the saints. Who are these people? What's that? The elect, yeah. So here we can see, remember we talked about the, uh, the, the ordo salutis, the order of salvation? You kind of see that reflected here. And then you also, just our understanding of some of these doctrines that we read in previous uh, paragraphs or peri previous chapters, like effectual call, right? When, when does that happen and how does it happen and all that, right? The effectual call happens in a moment of time in our life, in our own personal history, where God calls us to himself and it's effectual, right? It, that means it accomplishes its purpose in that time and space. Uh, we also have here, notice, uh, um, accepted in the beloved. So what does that mean? What's that? Adoption, yeah, united to Christ, right? So um, if we're accepted in the beloved, it's because of the work of Christ. Who is the beloved? Well, it's Christ. Right? And so we are accepted in God's presence because of the work of Christ. So those whom God has accepted in Christ, we're unified to him by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. He then calls us, right, effectually. When we are effectually called, you're given the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit right away begins his work of sanctification in your life. He is calling you and setting you apart, called to be saints, but also as you continue living your life, he's making you more and more conform to the image of Christ. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. So again, it's saying, look, those whom God, who accepts you, whom he called you, who he's sanctifying you by the Spirit, and he's also given you faith, right? So God is doing all that, right? He's done all those things. So if that was his purpose in bringing all those things about, right, you can see why no one's going to thwart his purposes. What, what did you have in there that God hasn't given you? Right? He's given you all these things. He's given you faith. He's given you uh, the call. He's given you his spirit. Right? And so we see this as rooted in eternity from his plan of redemption. Uh, he has planned all this accordingly. Right? We've read in other scriptures in Ephesians about how he chose us before the foundation of the world. Right? This, is, and so it, this goes hand in hand with the doctrine of election. Okay? So... Um, you can see here we're accepted, we're called, we're sanctified, and we're given faith of his elect. So right there, how many points of the doctrines of grace or Calvinism do you see? There's a few, aren't there? Yeah, and so think of this. Let's turn to John 3. And this is a text here that I think we still see a lot of these same points. And again, this is zooming out from God's perspective to just see his work of redemption in us. And if he started the work, he will complete the work. Okay, so in John uh, 3, I believe, is it John 3? It might be John 6. I think I wrote 3 wrong. How does John 3 start for you guys? I think I messed up on my notes. Yeah, go to, uh, go to 6, sorry. Yeah, John 6, 37. Let's read 37 to 40. Someone want to read that? So that's a, a big text that, you know, we look at the perseverance of the saints really because the eternal security we have in Christ, right? The Father gave them to Christ and he will never cast us out. He will always receive us as we come to him by faith. He will also continually uh, uh, keep us, right? 
no one can snatch them out of my hand. Um, this is the will of him who sent me. This is the plan before the foundation of the world, that I should lose none of them. Right? And so if God has elected you, if he's called you, if he has uh, united you by grace through faith in Christ, and you're accepted in the beloved through him, you have his Holy Spirit, he's sanctifying you, that means you will be secure. Now, that's a helpful and assuring doctrine for us because as we are in this world, there's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of uh, tensions, there's a lot of trials and things that we face. And so this paragraph is going, going to talk about these things, but it also is gonna help us have more assurance of our salvation, that he who began a good work in you will complete it, okay? Uh, God's will, notice it says, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing. So God's will is that you persevere. All the elect will come to faith, and all the elect will have eternal life. Okay, so any thoughts first off, just on perseverance asserted in this first sentence? That should be pretty straightforward, and I believe most of the translations should be in accord with that, even the modern one. The next thing is what we're gonna see here is two, two uh, sentences here. And what we see is it's going to be, here's perseverance defined negatively, then here's perseverance defined positively. So let's first look at perseverance defined negatively. So it says, neither can neither totally nor finally fall from the state of grace. Okay, now this language here is intentional and the language I wanna bring out here is totally and finally, okay? Um, now this, this, this phrase here, totally fall away from the state of grace, that's in direct contradiction to Rome the Roman Catholic Church. Because they, what they had is they had this doctrine, okay, you could, you could have salvation, you can be justified, but then if you've committed this mortal sin or whatever, and you haven't had penance, you haven't had baptism, whatever that is, then if you die after that fact, then you're gonna go to purgatory or hell, and you can fall away from a state of grace. And so you need to come to the Roman Catholic Church and pay penance, and we will make you back into that state of grace. So it's possible to fall away from it. Um, and this one here is saying, look, uh, believers cannot totally fall away. And so the Roman Catholic Church really wanted you to lack assurance. So you depend on them. To lack assurance, so, oh man, I need, I need to keep coming. I need to keep paying penance. I need to keep going to confession. I need to keep doing all these things to make sure I'm in a state of grace. Because what happens if I have that lustful thought in my, eye, then, in my head and then I'm a, in a car wreck and I die? Then I could go to hell. And so that's kind of the doubt they created. And so here in our confession, the Reformed are saying, look, you, it, is, it is impossible for believers to totally fall away from that state of grace. So they're using that language, fall away, to, to deal with that. Now here, uh, notice this word total is, is not undermining that believers still struggle with sin. It's to say there it might be for a season in a believer's life, where you do fall away from a state of grace, right? But it's not total. There might be a season where true believers are, are falling in sin, but then all true believers will be drawn back, will repent and be restored. There will never be a totally falling away, right? Notice it says, but they will not totally fall away. And instead, what God does is maybe even when they're in that state of uh, where they've, falling away from that season of grace, God still will give them a spirit of conviction. And we see this with David, right? When he was in sin, when he, when he was not confessing his sin, when he hid it and he, he dwelt within it, uh, he was convicted to the point of dehabilitation, right? And so that is the spirit of God working in his life to convict him of his sin, to draw him to repentance, right? It says God's patience is meant to lead us to repentance. So there's a season where we might, for a season, fall away from this state of grace because we've done it to ourselves. We've separated uh, from the things of God. We've given into the world. We've given into uh, our flesh. And But true Christians will not commit a certain sin that will take them away from their salvation they have, the security. There's no sin that you can commit that will take you away from that. True believers will come to uh, 
we'll, be, we'll come back to the, that state. Notice again, too, the next language here. It says believers cannot finally fall away. So it might be for a season where they fall from a state of grace, but it's not total. It's not like God has completely stopped convicting them or whatever. For an unbeliever, we can say that is true, right? But for true believers who are just given in to sin for a season, God is still working in them to bring them back. Believers also, at the, in the end, you cannot finally fall away from the state of grace. So at the end of their lives, if a believer dies, they're, they're not going to be found in a state of fallen away condition, like the Roman Catholic Church might do. This isn't also like, um, like the Arminians might say, okay, well, you know, they, they were Christians for a season and they had the spirit, they did all these things, but then they chose after the world, it just shows they weren't of them. So another thing here is, uh, this is saying, look, despite even our sins, because of our standing before God is based on the work of Christ, we cannot totally fall away. So this is something that true believers are secure in these things. Um, John 10, flip over to John 10. This is similar to what Jesus says in John 6, but in John 10, verse 27, says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand, and I and the Father are one. So what, what great assurance this gives us, right? Um, no one, no, you know, there might be rulers, there might be authorities, there might be people we fear in this world, but they might kill the body, but they cannot kill our soul, right? And so no one can snatch us out of the Father's hand. And Christ is saying they will never perish. So if you're truly an elect person of God, you've been called, you have the Holy Spirit, he's working in you, uh, the numerous graces that we see, uh, he's given you true faith, right? It might be even a weak faith for a time, but God's growing that. If you have that, as you continually look to Christ, right, there's means by which he gives us to persevere. It's not like he just elects you and then abandons you and says, all right, rest is up to you. No, he gives you the very means to persevere you. The Holy Spirit, the means of grace, right? We'll go through many of these as we continue through this chapter. But the thing is, he uses means to persevere you, to keep you. Any thoughts, comments on these so far? Okay, let's look at perseverance expressed positively. So we can neither totally nor finally fall from a state of grace, but shall certainly persevere therein to the end and eternally and be eternally saved. So you've heard the saying, once saved, always saved, right? That, that, that is a, a very true uh, statement, uh, but I like it more so saying, uh, if God has begun a good work, he will complete it. God will keep you. Uh, Philippians 1, 6, when he ushers in the new heavens and new earth, when eternity Positively, so here's what it's not. It's not losing it totally and finally, but positively. So there's two things I want you to see here in this, in this verse in particular. Notice, notice I brought out positively, uh, it is persevering to the end, and then negatively what it's not, it's not totally falling away or finally. So you see that both in this, in this here. It says, if they had been of us, namely of the elect, they would have continued, right? If they were chosen. But they went out, us, out of us. Why? That it might become plain they were not of us. So why did they uh, finally fall away from that state of grace? Why did they totally fall away from that state of grace? Well, because they were never part of that state of grace. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean that down the road, God might not, convert them, truly, to be, be part of that. So just because someone might depart from that or maybe was raised in a Christian home and then went in, uh, in the, to the world, 
uh, we still pray for that. We, there's never, we never know someone's heart truly until their dying breath. If they die rejecting the Lord, that's the only way you know uh, if they are un, uh, unelect. So we should never assume they're not, even though they might be doing rebellious, evil things. God could call them to himself in a later time in life. And so we should always be praying for those things, right? Because if they are, they will eventually be called and they will persevere. Okay, uh, the next one was 2 Timothy 2.19. Who has that? Someone read that. Good. So notice the language of seal, right? Uh, that's a, a, an idea of it's, it's kept secure. Um, God has sealed us for the day of redemption. And uh, then he also says, how do you know them? Well, you know them by their fruits. You know them by the good things they do, right? And that's really what James has been arguing as well. How do we know what true faith is? How do we know what true wisdom is? Well, you know them by their deeds. So some may fall away, and it's because their profession is not genuine. And how do you know it is genuine? Well, if they persevere. Perseverance is one of those fruits that God is working within us, right? And that it requires our participation. It's all his work because he's worked it in us. We are working it out, okay? So it's all his work. He gets the glory, but we are called to run. We are called to strive. We all are called to persevere and endure, right? So it's not just a let go flop and just see what happens in life. It's, it's participation. Notice next the reasons, or we can say the factors of perseverance. Why does God need to persevere us? First off, seeing the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Once he still begets and nourishes them in the faith, repentance, love, joy, hope, and all the graces of the Spirit unto immortality. So here's some of the reasons why he perseveres us. Okay, now does anyone have any different language there? This might be the section where the modern might be a little more helpful. The modern one? Yeah, so it says, seeing the gifts and callings of God are without repentance, whence he still begets and nourishes them in the faith. Anything major stand out there? Okay, does it say seeing the gifts of God and callings of God are without repentance, or does it say something else? Okay, there you go. So in the modern, in the modern translations, they're trying to bring out this idea here, right? It says seeing the gifts and callings of God are without repentance, Right, so without repentance, that might be like, okay, what does he mean by that? Well, he does give us repentance. He does grant us repentance, right? That is a, that is a grace that he gives us, right? That's what he's talking about later. Nourishes them in faith, repentance, love, things he does in us. But because he begets and he nourishes them in the faith, uh, because he gives us gifts, because he calls us without repentance, mainly he doesn't repent. Mainly what it means is he doesn't change his mind. If he's chosen to do this, if he's chosen to give you these gifts, to bring uh, the new life, to bring you the gift of faith, to bring justification, sanctification, if he's called you, he's not going to change his mind. He's not going to go back on his promises. If, if he's given you a call and he's brought it effective, he's not going to say, you know what, I'm going to hang up that call now and, and just uh, pretend I never made it. Accident, dial the wrong number. No, that's not God. He doesn't change his mind. He doesn't make mistakes, right? And so he is without repentance. This is the doctrine of uh, immu immutability, right? He doesn't change his mind. So if he's chosen you, if he's began a good work in you, he's not going to abandon the work. He's going to complete it. He's going to do what he started. If he gave you the gifts, if he's called you, those things are without change in God. So you can have assurance that he will persevere you because of his nature. He's an unchanging God. 
Any thoughts or comments on that? I think that really helps us, you know, give you uh, a sense of assurance there. If you think of just the nature of God, right? Think of, think of Israel and their sin and how often they sinned. And if God was like a God of the Greek gods who uh, became very furious whenever there was a sin and he like arose him to anger, and he's like, oh, I need to spite them, right? We have reason to fear. Every little sin we do, we have reason to fear because is this going to make God go over the edge or not? But what did God tell uh, the Israelites? He says, because I don't change, you're not consumed. Because I don't change, you're not consumed. And the same thing with us. Because he started a, his work of salvation, even despite our sins, we're, he's not going to revol- revolt that. He's not going to go back on his calling. Mike? Yeah, and you just had to purge it out of, out of, out of you in order to make it there. It might mean, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and it's what does that do? Well, it keeps their church in business. It keeps the money flowing in. It keeps active participation. If you can create this fear and sense of you don't know if you're saved or not, that's going to mean you need to depend on the church and you need to continually going through all these different rituals and penance and all this stuff just to give you assurance, but they don't want you to have assurance. It's momentary. If they say assurance, it's very momentary until you have that one lustful thought, then, oh, you better go back. Um, That's why Luther, when he was going, when he was part of the Catholic Church, he was going to confession all the time because his conscience was pricked and he's understanding the holiness and righteousness of God as he's reading the book of Romans. And he's like, I need, I need to constantly be coming here. And the, the priest is like, come back when you have something actually worth confessing. And he's like, don't you understand the holiness of God? I need to be confessing all the time if this is the case. And that's really what the Roman Catholic Church is trying to drive is, is you cannot have assurance and, and if we're honest, if, if it was just based on our own efforts, yeah, we could never have assurance, but it's based on the work of Christ and his eternal plan. Ellie? Just to remind you, um, you compare it to uh, God who created and Right. And so as you look at these different scriptures that we've looked at, I think that it's meant to well us, well in a, up in us a sense of hope, a sense of security in that. So despite what all life may come, God will not uh, have a, abandon us and he will not lose us. So even when things look really, really hard, um, we have the assurance that God will not abandon us. So that's going to continue in this paragraph a bit more. Um, so notice he doesn't revoke his calling. He is without repentance, meaning he doesn't change his mind. So if he, if he called you, if he gave you these gifts, right, he's not going to go back on that. Notice what else it says. Whence, he still begets and nourishes in them faith, repentance, love, joy, hope, and all the graces of the Spirit unto immortality. So what is that a list of? The fruit of the Spirit, yeah. So God is, notice, continually, he still does this. He's beginning, he's nourishing you in the faith, and he's developing in you the fruit of the Spirit. He's growing fruit, right? Because he continues his work, he's producing all these many graces of the Spirit in your life. And if he's continually doing that, he's not going to just abandon it and say, okay, um, he's just encountered way too much in this life, so I guess we have to abandon work and move on to someone else. No. He's going to continue it. He's unchanging. He keeps our faith alive. He continues to grow and strengthen our faith. And like I said, he does that through means. 
And so what we're doing today is, is a means to strengthen our faith, to strengthen our assurance, to have us look to him and his word. As we are going to worship today, it's, we are partaking in the means of grace. These are the very uh, primary means he uses to strengthen and build us up in the faith, and along with all the other graces that are out there. But the main thing is he is sustaining us because he's determined to do so, and he will continue to do so. All the fruit of the Spirit are active in us because he's causing them to grow by his Spirit. And what is that leading us to? Well, ultimately, it's leading us to uh, Christ-likeness, right? Sanctification, which has a goal in mind, right? In this world, you'll never fully achieve, you know, perfection, Christ-likeness in this world, but that's what he's preparing us for, right? He's leading us unto immortality. You can think of that eternal life, glorification. He will persevere us throughout our life to the end goal, eternal life. And he gives us all the necessary graces, us, graces to do so. Notice he nourishes us, right, in the faith. So as we are partaking of the preaching of the word, as we're partaking of the Lord's Supper, as we partake in prayer, as we see baptism happening, those are ways he nourishes us in the faith, right? He's nourishing us and reminding us of the hope we have in Christ. He's reminding us of our calling, that we are called to live as lights in this world. We're called to endure in the hardships, knowing that he's with us. And with that, we're reminded of the love he has for us. We're reminded of joy that we are to have, even in the midst of hardships and trials, where we have a great hope, right? The hope that First Peter talks about, that's secure, locked in heaven for you, that's guarded, that inheritance that awaits you, that, that is guaranteed as you live life here in this world. And you just don't live and then, you know, just say, you know what, I'm just going to live, let go, and just let God accomplish these things. No, he calls us to do things. He calls us to be salt and light. He calls us to go out to the ends of the earth, proclaim the good news of the gospel. He calls us to give an answer for the hope that is within us. And as you do that, as you have that assurance in mind, you can be bold. You can, you know, not have to, so to speak, cherish your life and goods because you know your eternal life is secure. So whatever they might do, we don't have any reason to fear. We can be bold and persevere all the way to the end. This is a doctrine that many people who were persecuted for their faith latched onto because they saw these works that God is doing in them, nourishing their faith, that he's not going to revoke the calling, that he's calling them to, he's continually bringing up a state of repentance and faith and love and joy and hope in them. And as they're doing that, as they're faced with difficult decisions like, like Tyndale, should I translate the Bible in English even though that's illegal? Well, this is what God's word is he wants it to be accessible to all, so I'm going to do that. And it, count, it, it, took, it meant his life, right? But he's willing to do that. Christians are willing to do things for the sake of the faith because of this doctrine. And so that should, one, embolden us, but also stir up those graces, stir up those graces that he gives us through the Spirit uh, to love and good deeds. Any thoughts or comments? I think this might be a good pausing point to look at the next half later. Richard?
That's an excellent, excellent text there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for sharing. That, that's one of my favorite texts and one that, you know, lets you know, even despite persecution, trials, hardships we encounter, um, knowing trials are meant to sanctify us, knowing the purpose, uh, the end result's there. Salvation, right? The salvation of our souls that he's kept for us. So basically the reason that happens is because God has ordained it. God has secured it. It's his plan and he's bringing it about. And he does so through means. So we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, next time. Really, uh, any last comments or thoughts here? Uh, Brian? I find it interesting that the order is listed here. Faith, repentance, love, joy, hope, and all grace of the Spirit and immortality. And then when you look at 2 Timothy 19, where it says, the Lord knows who are his. And you find sometimes that whether it be death, death, confession, may only get to faith. They may not have a chance to visit one of the parents. Or some of these other things they just all of a sudden realize it's faith. And it's not and we may not see it. But the Lord knows who the truth are his. And it's uh incumbent on us to trust in the Lord in this case. You think back and even my own life. Not walking and not exercising these other things or showing these other things, and yet I think it's still this kid. Um, just looking back at this what was inside me. Don't call it guilt, but you call it guilt because it was there. Mm. Yeah, all, all Christians will have some sort of fruit, and you know, these will these will be sent forth, and sometimes fruit can be uh, I guess you can say uh, stunted. Uh, based on environments, based on what we know, what we're exposed to, and and different things. You know, I look at you know my uh, childhood growing up in church, and I, I look. I had, I think I had faith, but I didn't. I didn't really have abundant fruit. I didn't. I didn't see that until I was in high school, and then I'm like, okay, now it's more noticeable. And so I, sometimes I'm like, was I saved or was I not? And and I think it might have been like because of the environment that I was in at the time. It just wasn't uh, a robust. Uh, knowledge of scripture and teaching and it's kind of easy believism and uh, but then once I was exposed to a little bit more uh, doctrine and expository preaching that's when I started to see uh, more fruit and so God uses means to bring that about uh, but yeah um, sometimes some people on their deathbed and that's you know that's up to God's plan and sovereignty there and you know we're not to look at that and be like oh well that's not fair i had to do all this other fruit i had to do all these things he's like well, that's a privilege you get to do those things and some might not have that opportunity like the thief on the cross yeah Teresa, you can say something go ahead yeah Exactly. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's why I like that last sentence where we just read. He's bringing us, he still begets repentance. He still begets that faith and love, right? So even in our sin, the, the Christian attitude is, I recognize that sin and I'm going to repent and turn from it and seek forgiveness in the Lord. And that is growing our faith, is recognizing our sins. And that's how God perseveres us through this life, is he is growing in us a continual state of repentance, Right? So it's not this, oh, you live this perfect life. It's not, what do you do when you sin? It's you turn to him, you recognize, you repent, and you seek forgiveness through him. And he lavishly grants us forgiveness. So yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah, living faith. Yeah, those are the fruits of the Spirit. So fruits that flow out of that faith.
Yeah. Anything else? Kevin? Yeah. And, you know, God, uh, God knows our hearts. And there can be times even in utter weakness where we do unthinkable things. But God ultimately knows the heart, and he knows those who are his. And he'll, he'll judge right. So, All right, well, let's be concluded here. Let's pick up the next section. So the next section, if you're following along in your Trinity Psalter, uh, the next section is all First London. It's all from First London that they're bringing in. So uh, let's... Go ahead and pause there. We'll look at the second uh, part of chapter one, paragraph one next time. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for this doctrine of perseverance. And uh, Lord, it helps us look to Christ and his work and to rest in him and also know that, uh, that uh, you have secured us. If that's what you've ordained before the foundations of the world, you will bring that purpose to accomplish. And so Lord, we, we thank you for that and how you call us to press on, to persevere as we look to Christ. And so, Lord, we pray you would help us by your spirit to do that.